Hey, this is David. I'm going to truly introduce myself in a few minutes, but this is a PowerPoint presentation. And as you see on the screen, it is about the Holy Bible. I am going to pray at the beginning of this, and I'm also going to pray at the end of it. And I hope that I can do this within the time frame that I have set in my mind in order to do this. But let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Father, I was come to glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you as you have given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him, and this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, of whom you have sent. I've glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O Father, glorify you, me with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name unto the men which you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them me, and they have kept your word. And now they have known that all things whatsoever you have given me are of you. For I have given unto them the words which you gave me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from you, and they have believed that you did send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which you have given me, for they are yours, and all yours are mine, and all mine are thine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your own name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those that you gave me, I kept, and none of them are lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture may be fulfilled. And now come out to you. And these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. I am not of the world, neither they for not of the world. Sanctify them through your truth, and your word is truth. If you have sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they may be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also who shall believe on me through their word, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, and that the world may believe that you have sent me, and the glory which you have given me, I have given them, that they may become one as we are, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I will that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory for which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundations of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you did send me, and I have declared unto them your name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith may be in them, and I in them. So that's the prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your prayer that the Lord prayed. Now, this presentation, as you can see, is, as I said earlier, from the Bible. What you see on the screen is my picture. I'm going to introduce myself in detail later on, but let us now look in this process that we're talking about now is God's Word, and we for the first time, are doing this in the manner that we're doing it. I've never, I've talked to Bauer many years now, and on radio and off radio, but now I'm trying to give you something in a form because I said pictures worth a thousand words, and I'm going to give you all these words of God in a picture form. At the bottom of the, my name, you'll see my name. You see, it says, Come let us share the meaning and reward for one to enter into God's rest. And he rested on the seventh day from all his works of which he had made. And that's in the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. And also in the book of he Hebrew, in the chapters 3, 1 through chapter 4, 16. That's not what this is about. This is just a, one of the previous lessons that I decided to use this uh, thumbnail in order to present what I'm teaching in the Bible, regardless of what lesson it is. I've dubbed this lesson as a Sunday school uh, a Sunday school lesson for today's class. This is a Sunday school lesson, but it's for today's class. Whatever day you see this PowerPoint presentation, it is a Sunday school lesson presented in today's class. What we're going to be talking about is the Word of God, and we're starting in, in this particular instance here for a reason, because we're going to be talking about 
uh, the Word of God and and what's in the Word of God. It is the close in the in the Word of God in the book of Second Peter and also in the book of Psalms that one day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. What that means is one day with God is a thousand of your years of our years. And if we were to live uh, one thousand years, we would have only have lived one day with God. So the purpose of this to show you in the, this book of the generations of Adam, it is to show you that in the chapter 5 of the book of Genesis, verse 1 through verse 32, it gives you the generations of Adam. The significance of this is to show you that how long Adam lived, which was 930 years, which was not quite one day. But then one of his grandchildren, Methuselah, if you want to read this for yourself, you see that Methuselah lived 969 years, which was, well, 39 years more than his grandfather, Adam. But neither did Methuselah live one day with the Lord because one day with the Lord is a thousand years. Now, that's this is going to be like two times you're going to see the information, but our pictures were for a thousand words, as it said, is said. I'm not going to go through this entire uh, chapter here because you can stop this uh, presentation and see it for yourself, or you can also go back to the book of Genesis, regardless of what versions of the Bible you're using, and see this also for yourself. The significance of this also is to give you uh, the age of Noah. Noah was down, and we know the story when we read this uh, chapter here. We'll see that Noah was the one, that uh, second one that walked with God because his grandfather, Enoch, had also walked with God. Now, there's some significance about Enoch because we're going to see Enoch in two or three different places in the Bible as we also see Noah, but the significance of Enoch is that he was 65 years old when his first child was born, but yet he lived 365 years, which was a shorter time than any of his brothers or any other time than those around him at that time. Significant is that Enoch prophesied, and we're going to talk about his prophecy later on as we go through this presentation. In this particular a slide here. We're only trying to show you the genealogy and the days where it started that these uh, forefathers were living and where the information came from, starting with Adam going all the way down to Joseph. You can stop this slide and see the ages of those persons, but the significance of the both the, this slide and the previous one is to show you that God letting us know that he one day with him is a thousand of our years. Understanding that and understanding that this is also in reference to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is that God's Son, Jesus the Christ, is also listed here because in the prayer that we just prayed, which is in the book of John, chapter 17, of the entire chapter of the book of John 17, he's praying and letting you and I know that he was with the Father before the world was created. And that's some of the things we're going to highlight in this presentation here, primarily is what took place before God created the world. The purpose of us in this information here, you see where uh, source of it is not my source. I did not make this chart. I only use, I'm only using it to show you the ages and the source of this information is all given on this particular slide. All right. Now, this is also from the book of Genesis. As you see, it's highlighted at the top, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and so subdue it. And we're, we're going to be talking about this, and, and it's a well, it's a little longer than what we normally would talk about because this uh, chapter of this particular book, as you know, uh, goes from down to 31 verses. But what you see on this slide here is verse 1 through 31, and it's giving you the first creation that God created. He created the world. First day, second day, third day, fourth day is what you see on this leaf here. But we're going to go on further next, on, into the this uh, fifth and sixth day. Now, and this subject matter that you see in this, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it is instructions that God gave to man that he created in his image. And we'll see that on this slide here. So God uh, 
was creating the world is what we're going to be talking about in a few minutes too. And this is part of the time that God was creating the world, that God created man in his own image, it says in verse uh, 27 of the Bible. Uh, Genesis is saying that he created man in his own image. But well, what we really want to understand in this, uh, is that God said, let us make man in our image. Father, Son, precious Holy Spirit is the image that he's talking about, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and there are those now will take that verse and say this is the trinity of God. Well, God, Father, God, Son, and Holy Spirit is only one God. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit is not a, well, I'll, I'm going to say that he is one God according to what we're going to see in this lesson here, even though we come up with the word Trinity, which is not given in the book of Genesis nor any other books in the Bible. Do you see this word that we mankind use as being God in a Trinity? Well, Trinity means three, but God is seven spirits, as we'll see later on, if we're going to suggest that this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of Spirit. Now, in John chapter 4, 24, letting us know that God is a spirit. God is a spirit, and we that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, understanding that he is a spirit, Father, he is a spirit, Son, he is a spirit, Holy Spirit, does not designate him to be in Trinity. Not going to get involved in that. The significance of this is what took place when God was creating the world in the sixth day, is saying, and we'll see that in 1 and 26, and we'll see that God is saying, let us make man in our image. God said, let us make man in our likeness, and he created man in his image according to what we're seeing. And what the significance of this is I want you to hold a pen in your mind here because we're going on now to other slides. But now look down at the bottom. I've taken the word subdue out of the dictionary to give you us an indication of what this word subdue means when God was giving them the instructions as we see here in this particular chapter. God has given the men in the, that he created in his image instructions as to go out and to conquer subgate and to take physical force of what he had created. Now, the question that I was asking the Holy Spirit is, what took place, and when I was studying this many, many years ago, what took place when you were creating the male and female in your image and giving them the instruction to subdue the earth? What was on the earth that needed to be conquered? Or what was on the earth that needs subduction? What was on the earth that need to be that needed to be uh, taken out and out of off the earth? So that question would linger until God, the Holy Spirit, gave me the insight as to what this means. Now, in the book of Malachi, and I put that there for a reason too, in chapter three, verse six, it said, "For I am God; I change not." Don't look for God to change, but everything around you will change. Whoever we are, it, whatever the sources are around us, it's going to change. Everything in time changes, but the creator of himself is letting us know that he does not change. So he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's the past, the present, and the future, all at the same time. So understanding that as we go forth, we're going to, Remember in this pro, uh, presentation, though, we're going to come back to this particular chapter, chapter 1, verse, I'm sorry, uh, Genesis, yeah, chapter 1, verse 26 is what we're going to come back to. Let us look now at the earth of Abraham. We're not going to go back prior anymore, back up to Abraham. I only started above Abraham, back to Adam, to show the, the time. The timing of God is that one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, which means that no human being has actually lived one day with God. Methuselah was the only oldest that I could see living 969 years, but I don't see where anyone else lived recordedly uh, longer than that. And I say recordedly because there were uh, many other uh, persons living other than the ones that we saw but we don't know the age. Are we going to believe that the Holy Spirit, being the author of the Holy Bible, that he had not come up with anyone living longer for the niggas of us to know? But now we're looking at the seed of Abraham. Seed of Abraham. 
we'll notice that Abraham had a, a Hagar had a child fathered by Abraham called Ishmael. Sarah had a child fathered by Abraham called Isaac. And then Korah had a, a children by Abraham. So you see the seed of Abraham, you see eight seed of Abraham when you look at the diagram that we see. So we're talking about Abraham and the persons on the earth. So if we look at this real closely, we can see all of the seed of Abraham offsprings from the three females that he had children, uh, uh, had conceived children by, by Abraham. So what we're talking about is the earth now. When that's what we're actually talking about is going from this point on to see why we are where we are with now in the passage generation of time. And back if we go back and look at the chart that was given by the Torah, we'll see that that time it was up to I believe it was twenty four hundred. So one day being twenty four hundred wouldn't designate to be two a little over two days with God. We're gonna go on. God is in the book of Job, and the, the Bible is recorded that God's words is like a double-edged sword. It, re, it cuts both ways, in other words. So in other words, what I, it's telling us in that statement is that it's like a double-edged sword. You can read the Bible from the book of Revelations to the book of Genesis. Matter of fact, at one time and another, people did read from from uh, right to left as opposed to right, right to left to right. But we in the earth today primarily read, well, many of us, and there still may be some that reads left to right, and it is what I'm uh, uh, understanding. And then there be most of us, however, read going uh, left to right. But in, if we read the Bible from Revelation to Genesis, we're going to get the same information that we were to read it from Genesis to Revelation. So in this particular uh book here, the book of Job, is what this is really uh, hinging on. In the book of Job, God is t uh, talking to Job out of a whirlwind because Job had gone through some changes, and we know if you study the book of J uh, Job from 1 up through 41, of what we're going to come here, uh, we're talking about things that happened to Job and that God allowed happen to Job. In this case here, we're going to go back and look at those, but we're going to introduce the first part of this because we started uh, chapter 38. God is asking Job all of these questions with Job. The significant one that we're going to look at is when God was asking Job to declare if he knew what he was saying. And the reason why God is talking to Job here is because Job has executed what one thing that God hates. Now, God himself described, if we're going to see in a minute, described Job to us as a righteous and upright man, one that eschewed evil. That's who, how God described Job. So if you, or he, or you as a human being, male or female, if you're righteous and upright, it still does not exclude you from having the one thing that God hates. And that's what we're talking about here. And that hatred not only was with Job, but the hatred went on further, further back. We can go all the way back to uh, the well before the beginning when the, say, Satan himself was cast out of heaven. It was because of the one thing that God hates. And we're going to continue to talk about this one thing that God hates that God is talking to Job about here. But he has given us some information as to why he hate these, what he hate. So God is asking Job this question, see, uh, in the beginning of the book of 30, uh, chapter 38 of the book of Job, uh, God is answering Job out of a whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? He's asking Job these questions, who he's talking to, because Job is, he's letting Job know you don't know what you're talking about. And let's keep on going down to child, verse 7. It says, He's asking Job, well, let's look at six. Whereupon are the foundations there are fastened, or who laid the foundation thereof? He's asking Job about the earth now. Who has created this world that that you talk about? You declare if you can give me understanding. Or who laid the measures of there up on the earth? You can't, you don't know that, Job. Job can't answer the, the question. So God asked Job, uh, who, uh, whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstones thereof 
watch this question, when the morning stars sang together and all of the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, that's the question that we as a human being should understand why God is asking Job, where were you when these things was happening? Now, if we were to go back to the chart and look at the, the chart of the world, we'll see that the children that Abraham begot other than out of after Sarah died, the wife that he had, concubine that he had after Sarah died, is where the land of Oz. So the question is, we're going to ask that when we get to verse uh, chapter 1, verse 1, where is the land of Oz? Well, the land of Oz was in one of those offsprings of Abraham's people where Job came from, which was a righteous people. Job was a righteous and upright man, but they didn't know what they had, neither do we. The morning stars sing together. Who are the morning stars, one may ask. Who are the sons of God, one may ask. And I would hope that for that answer to be given so that we understand who these sons of God are and who, what they mean to us today. Now, if we go on to this uh, understanding the, the, the book of Job, Job is talking to God, and God is chastising Job because Job has exerted pride. God hates pride, and Job had bragged, braggadocialized himself to his three friends about him not sinning. He bragged about it, and that didn't give God the credit. That was a form of pride, and God is chastising Job because of the pride that he has, has uh, exemplified before his three friends and God listening to the discussion between Job and his three friends. And what Job is responsible for is that he had not sinned, and that, that was a braggadocious type of a response, and God would not allow that to happen. The question that I'm asking here is why would why would God not speak to the sons of God? Now we just was introduced to the sons of God by God in the 38th chapter. Remember I said you go you know, it's like a double edged sword. I didn't start at the first verse. I started at chapter the first chapter. I started at chapter 38. And in chapter 38 we were introduced to these sons of God. Well, when we are talking about the sons of God in chapter 1 of the book of Job, we really don't know who they are. We, we had already seen them back up in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, where we're going to go through in a few minutes. But if we go back now to the introduction of the sons of God, they were introduced to us in the world, in the Bible, in chapter 38 of the book of Job, not in Genesis chapter 6. Even though they are there, we don't know who they are because it does not tell us anything about other than the fact that the sons of God saw that the men of the earth was women of the earth was fair and they took the marriage as many as they chose. But that does not introduce or tell us who these sons of God are in the book of Genesis. Now here in the book of Job in chapter one, we still don't see these who these sons of God are in chapter one. But we do see this question that I asked a few minutes ago about the the land of Oz. The land of Oz, where Job was from, is where it's not important in this lesson here, but it does, we do know what where the lands of Oz were and where Job came from out of the lands of Oz. But the significance of this is to show that he eschewed evil, God said, but still, Job, even though he eschewed evil, and that was born unto him the ten sons, etc., etc., it does not get uh, understanding until we get down into the chapter when we find that Job, that the sons of God, went to present themselves to the Lord, and the devil went with them also. But God did not speak to the sons of God. He spoke only with the devil. Well, I'm not going to get into that because it would take long the time that I have. But we do go now to the second chapter of the book of Job, the second time that God did not speak to the sons of God. The second time it said, and again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan. So there again, God is talking to Satan and not talking to the sons of God who went to present themselves to God. Now, at this point in time, having read Genesis 
all the way down through the book of Job. We have not seen these sons of God except in the book of Genesis chapter 6. And when now we see them again in the book of Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, but it does not tell us who they are, where they came from, until we get over to the 38th chapter, which we started in this presentation. 38th chapter is saying that God is asking Job, where were you when the morning stars sang together and all of the sons of God shouted for joy? Well, now these sons of God that were shouting for joy had a reason for shouting for joy. We don't understand what the joyfulness were at that time, and we have already passed a whole lot of information that we have not seen other than into lessons such as this one here. Now, if we go back now up to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and look now at the description that God is saying that to about the uh, male and female they made, and they're giving them the instruction to subdue. So this instruction to subdue, to do other than, other than what we're talking about right now. You see, these sons of God had done some things that they should not have done, and God had to clean up what they have done. Because remember now, he's letting us know that the sons of God were shouting for joy as he, God, were creating the world or creating the earth. He was being joy. It was joyful. They were joyful while God said he was laying the foundations of the cornerstones up on the earth. The sons of God were shouting for joy. So now God creates the earth and now who comes to the earth after God created earth? Well, listen at the answer that two times that Satan gave God. He said, where have you been? Satan answers him two times in chapter one. And again, right here we see in chapter two that Satan answers God. said, I've been from two and to and fro from walking in and up and down the earth. Okay, well, now God had already created the earth, and we know that Satan was cast out of heaven, so now Satan has been cast out of heaven. And the question that God is asking Satan for you and I, uh, to know where the answer is going to come from. Satan said, I've been to and fro from walking in and up and down the earth. That's why I have been. So now we know that the whole earth that God created has been now tainted by Satan. And now we're talking about these now sons of God. The sons of God were not, as we have mis mistakenly seen over and over again, reference in uh, Adam and Seth. Nothing to do with that because the sons of God were shouting for joy before God formed Adam. Seth was Adam's son. So before God formed Adam, the sons of God were shouting for joy before God created the earth. So the myth that the, that's been put out about Adam's son, Seth, having sons of God is, if that's right, then the Bible is wrong. I believe the Bible is right. So I use the information in the book of Job to say that the sons of God were shouting for joy as God was creating the earth. Now, now we go back back to Genesis to see why these sons of God that were shouting for joy in the 30th chapter of the book of Job, same sons of God that were uh, went to present themselves to God two times in the book of Job, and God both times asked the devil, where have you been? Where have you been? He didn't say anything to the sons of God. He's asking the devil, where have you been? Now the other question is, why does the why do the, uh, does the devil go with the sons of God who went to present themselves to the Lord? You would think that the devil knew why they were going to present themselves to the Lord. And you would also think that they knew why the devil was coming among them to present themselves to the Lord. They would also know why the God did not speak with them because he, he spoke with the devil, but did, we all know that God cast the devil out of heaven, but we don't see any information that the sons of God, who was shouting for joy as God was creating the work in heaven, we don't see anything showing that he gave them permission to leave or gave them permission to be in the position to marry the women of the earth. Now, what did that come about, marrying the women of the earth? is in here in the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis, which is recorded that it came to pass and man began to multiply. As you go back up to the first two slides, I'll show you three sides. Man began to multiply upon the earth and daughter was born to them. And the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were fair and they took wives and them wives of which 
they chose. So the choice was theirs as to how many wives they would have of the daughters that were born to the sons of men. If we keep on reading down in the verse, we'll see that they all produce offsprings by these sons of God. Now, these offsprings that we're talking about were offsprings up on the earth. This is why we'll keep on reading the book of uh, Genesis chapter 6. We'll see how God was grieved over the offsprings and the, what man was doing upon the earth. And these, why did it start? Where did it start? I'm glad you asked. Well, we have to go back now in the book of Job. Now, remember now, we're in the book of Genesis here. And if we didn't know about the book of Job, we would not know anything about the sons of God or what they were doing when God was creating the world. But now we know that the, what was taking place as God was creating the world, we know now that these sons of God were doing something before God <laughs> created the world. And then that we have to know by why now God created male and female in his image to and give them instruction to subdue the earth. What was wrong with the earth, one would ask, that needed to be subdued, now having the definition of what subdue mean, what was on earth that needed to have to be subdued that was so terrible that God grieved over the process as he's talking about right here in the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis. So understanding that the Bible is a, like a double-edged sword, you can't just read it straight through and understanding. you got to read it front, back, front, back in order to get the understanding. And you can get the understanding, and sometimes that may take some time before you get it. You can read a verse today, and you may not understand what you've read until four, three, four, five years later. So what we're talking about now is that these sons of God here in the book of Genesis chapter 6 that married the women of the earth, which was shouting for joy as God was creating the earth, left their habitation. We'll see that later on in the book of Second Peter and also in the book of Jude. They left their habitation, came to the earth voluntarily, and they now have done something that God just could not have, uh, uh, forgive them of and would not even speak with them in two times in the book of uh, Job, two times as the devil went to speak with them. But now the devil was already been cast out up on the earth and uh, answer to he gave God two times that he's been walking to and fro from heaven up and down the earth. Now remember now the devil alone was not just cast out of heaven but it said that he and one third of the angels in heaven were cast out with him. So we don't know how many that is what one third or how many have no idea but yet and still here we are now in this uh, sixth chapter of the book of Genesis understanding these sons of God that's talked about in the book of Genesis that married the women of the earth. Now, we go on now to this other part of this process to understand why God then had this uh, instructions given to subdue the earth, to subdue the earth. So, again, one day with the Lord is a thousand of our years, and a thousand of our years is just one day. So, we don't know how many days uh, God has taken since the creation. That's what we're uh, going to uh, suggest now. But going on with this, this is a uh, continued chapter of the book of Genesis chapter 6, is that God gave the flood, put the flood up on the earth. It says this in, in the uh, 6th chapter 17, and behold, I, God, I, even do bring flood waters up on the earth to destroy the flesh. Now, God destroyed the old world with water, as we, as we see here. And this is in the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis. And the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis goes all the way through what we're talking about here. Now, the whole process of this is to introduce to of this in this presentation, these sons of God and how these sons of God has put things up on the earth. So if I'm married to a man, I may be of this flesh. If I'm married to a woman and I'm a woman, I may be of this. If I have tattoos all over my body, it may be something wrong with this. There's something in the Bible that we just cannot ignore. One thing in the Bible, which I've also put in this lesson, is in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, it says, I am God and I change not. I change not. That's what God says. So what he said yesterday 
it's still in effect today and nothing that we can do to change it because God does not change. The only thing that changed is the man that God formed. The man that God formed changed. The one that he created changed because God had to have done something to these sons of God where they were shouting for joy before they were as he was creating the world. He was creating the world, but the world was created uh, before these sons of God uh, were left their estate and came to the world. That's what we're talking about. So now let me introduce myself. My name is David Richardson, and my uh, picture's on the screen. I put it there in the format that I did for a reason. Uh, uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is one. That's, how, that's why you see one plus one plus one equal one. The Jehovah plus Jesus plus the Holy Spirit is the one God. There's only one God. Now, we do see three three numbers, one, one, one. <laughs> that's three, but it's only one, if you can understand it. That's how I'm hoping to get it that way to show you why you would want to understand that. This to show that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is happened to be the same God. Now, in the book of Second Peter is where we're talking about that these angels that left their state. God, Second Peter, letting us know that God spared not the angels that left their state, but cast them down into hell and delivered them in chain of darkness and to reserve until the great judgment. And spared not the old world. That's what we saw back up there, where he and and saved Nora, the eighth from Adam, the preacher of righteousness, and bring the flood up on the world of the ungodly. So God washed away all these ungodly creatures that was created by these sons of God that made it with the women of the earth creating a habit. And that's why it is today. And they even go on to talk about the Sodom and Gomorrah, even in, in, uh, in, in this uh, t particular uh, book of the second Peter, it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, but Sodom and Gomorrah came about after the flood. Now, so what it is, instructions I was given to Noah is to put two of everything on the on the ark. So we're recommending that two of the uh, things that would put on the ark that's creeping up on the earth. It had to have been some of this flesh that God had destroyed before the flood that was put on the ark before the flood came because Sodom and Gomorrah came about after. And we do know today that the Bible is saying that man is a there are marriages between a man and a woman, but we do know today throughout this world that there are people the same sex are marrying and trying to justify the marriages that they have. They're putting all kind of things on their mouth and in the nose, and we're seeing them, that God talking to the Son of Man, why, why he's telling the Son of Man why he's destroying these persons that put these rings and things in their nose and our ears and things of that nature why he can't that do that because God created the flesh. And I just prayed the prayer that Jesus prayed himself before he died that God had given him power over all flesh. So he having power over all flesh, he has not given man instructions as to what he should do with the flesh that man has upon him. So we, we, we're only talking this way because what the Bible has in this book here, Second Peter, is giving us instructions to know that the sons that the angels, the sons of God that left their state, came to the uh, to the earth and now chained in the dark. Now we're in a few minutes we're gonna talk about the, this guy in Enoch that we talked about earlier who lived three hundred and sixty five years and it was he was uh sixty five when the oldest man ever lived was born. That's Methuselah of nine hundred and sixty nine years. But he was Enoch was sixty five when Methuselah was born, and and Enoch himself only lived three hundred and sixty five years, but his son lived three times the length that he did nearly. Now, if you want to go and read the book of Second Peter, we're, we're gonna it's really talking about these angels that God that left their state in heaven and came to the earth, met him on the earth. And what God was punishing them, so much so that God did not speak with them when they went to present themselves to the Lord in the book of Job. Now, there's another book that they did go to present themselves, and that was a, and they were called stars. You know that back in the book of Job, God said that the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The morning stars sang together, and all the 
sons of God? Well, the question is then, do you really know who the morning stars were? Well, the morning stars, according to what we find, is that the morning stars were called stars, but they were not stars like we look up in the sky and see stars. <laughs> the morning stars were not the stars that shine, as you know, just like the sons of God at that time were were uh, were, were called the sons of God, but not by Job, not by you and I. They were called the sons of God by God. God was asking Job, where were you as I was fastening the foundations of the world and laying the cornerstones upon it while the morning stars sang together and all of the sons of God shouted for joy. It's God's description to tell us the sons of God. That's who described them as sons of God. But now in Enoch, the sons of God went to present themselves to Enoch for Enoch to write petitions. Now, Enoch did prophesy, and we can see that in the book of Jude, that Enoch wrote, and we don't know anything other than what he wrote, but we do know it in the book of Jude that said that he prophesied. Now, here again, I'm coming back to this to show you that uh, this for two reasons. One is they see the green, all the uh, chart So here. This is Abraham's seed. Well, these are the eight sons of Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, and these other uh, six sons. Well, Job came from these other uh, six sons. So we have to tell those go another lesson to see that. But Job actually came from the from the person you see in the dark green. That's where Job is from. And then uh, all these other persons are still up on earth today. But now these seven spirits of God is where we're going to go now. So uh, remember now, I said earlier when the back start of this presentation, that the sons of God, I'm sorry, that the uh, that God had seven spirits, as, as we know. But the, many of us think that he's in Trinity, you know, like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That word Trinity pops up. But God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is the same God. Holy Spirit is God. Jesus Christ is God. And we said that in his prayer. And that's understanding we need to understand his prayer to see why he prayed for us and let us know he's asking God the Father himself to keep me from evil and evil from me. Two times he teaches me how to pray and for me to keep evil from me. And at the same time before he died, he's praying and asking him himself to keep me from evil. So the pro the the uh, evil was there and evil was with the father or with God as he was creating the world because the sons of God were evil. They're so evil that he cast them under darkness and chained under darkness until the great judgment forever in hell that says forever. Then says so temporary said forever. And then we go back into like this this guy called the Satan. He was uh, uh, loose for a thousand years and. We're going to go on with this, but the significance of this chart here is to talk about these seven spirits of God and also and show where they came from and why they're there and also to introduce Job's, uh, where Job came from. Job was not a descendant of Isaac. Job was not a descendant of Esau. Job was not a descendant, I'm sorry, of, of Ishmael. Job was a descendant of one of Ishmael's and Isaac's brothers, if you know what I'm saying, because Ishmael was Isaac's brother, yep, and the other six sons that Abraham had after Sarah died was also Ishmael and Isaac's brothers. So the uncle to the Jacob would be Job. Job's would be father would have been Jacob's uncle. Job's father would have been Esau's uncle, if you can follow what I'm saying. Just like Esau's, I'm a Isaac, I mean, Ishmael's children would also be an uncle to Jacob's people. Ishmael people would be an uncle to Esau's people. So these people out there running around here in America talking about the Muslims and what they do and what they do, don't realize that they are relatives because Ishmael uh, was a offspring, a seed of Abraham, and God blessed all of the seed of Abraham. That's my phone, but I'm not going to get it. I'm going to continue with this. But God blessed all the Abraham seed. Ishmael was blessed because he was seed. Abraham, uh, I'm sorry, Isaac was blessed because he was seed of Abraham. And all the other six sons was blessed because they were seed of Abraham. So the blessing of God said, I will bless your seed, Abraham. So Abraham had six, I'm sorry, had eight seed. And this, the seven spirits of God were sent forth into all the earth where the seed lived. If you can hear what I'm saying. Now, the seven spirits of God will find that in the book of Revelations, 
two or three times, but two times, one time in the fourth chapter, one time in the fifth chapter, and three times in the first chapter. But according to what we're seeing here, that the seven lamps and the fire that was burning before the throne, you find us in the book of Revelation, are, which are the seven spirits of God. And then we'll go down to um, chapter 5, uh, 6, we'll see that it's described as, and behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and all the four beasts and the uh, and the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth, which are sent forth into all the earth. Now, you notice what's not noted here is time. So if you come up with a time, it's your time, <laughs> because God does not give us a time. So if, if, you, if, if you go to someone else and they come up with a time, you take that because it does not say when these seven spirits of God were sent. But it does give us uh, the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits of God that were sent forth into all the earth is in the Bible giving us instructions about these seven spirits of God, which each human being hold one of uh, all these seven spirits. Each human being hold the seven spirits. So that's a lesson for another day. But the seven spirits that we talk about in the book of Revelation each human being hold those seven spirits. I'm going to conclude this now because I've been away for five minutes. We're concluding this now. We're now looking at God is looking to find himself a J-O-B or God is looking for a Job because God described Job as a righteous and upright man that eschewed evil. And that's what God wants us all to be is righteous and upright and avoid evil. Two times God teach us how to pray and keep us from evil, and he's also praying himself to keep us from evil. Evil is prevalent, peer prevalent, and when you try to do right, evil shows up. Uh, just that's what Paul is talking about. But we're not going to get into that. I'm showing you this to show you that God confessed to Job that your right hand can save you if you don't have this evil thing that he hates, which is pride. And lying, lust, and pride is in every human being. If you lie and you say you didn't lie, that's the pride. If you lust for something and, and say you didn't lust for it, that's pride telling you not to admit that you did. So pride is very subtle, but pride is worse than the lying and the lust. God hates it all, hates sin, period. But what I'm saying is lust has its sin, lying has his, and uh, pride hides behind all of them. Lying, lust, and pride is in every human being. I'm concluding this. Now I'm moving on. I'll show you now in the book of Jude, where the book of Jude is showing you that in, uh, the prophecy of Enoch, and I told you earlier that the significance of showing you that Enoch prophesied it, and if we didn't have a written form of his prophecy, we wouldn't have to, we just have to take uh, the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit are letting us know that that the angels that left their estate is telling us that in the book of Jude, verse 6, and the angels which kept not their first estate and left their own habitations, he have reserved everlasting chains under darkness until the great judgment and the great day. And then, then it's next to stop talking about uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. So what we're talking about in the book of Jude is basically, the, or not basically, but it is the same thing that we're talking about in Second Peter of these angels that left their state, and the same thing that we're talking about in the book of Job, and the same thing that we're talking about in the uh, the book of Genesis in chapter 6. I'm going to conclude it. I've, uh, I've been with you long enough now. I'm only going to show this as to why the church should get an understanding of the mission and the message in God's word, which was given to the Son of Man. Now, the Son of Man is word is used throughout the scripture too, but in this case here, we're talking about in the book of Ezekiel, where the Son of Man is telling us some things that we just really ought to think about. And it's one thing that we don't really get in, in the churches, and I've been in church now all my life, and one thing we don't get is an understanding of what God has given to the Son of Man. And he's talking about a period of time of 70 years, and he started talking about and giving us instructions as to what took place in the 30th year. Then it goes to the 6th year. Then it goes to the ninth year, and then to the 11th year. The story is being told. But we should all get an understanding 
of the prophecy. Whatever church you attend, get an understanding of the prophecy of the message and the mission that God was giving to the Son of Man. Now, I'm going to conclude this now. As I said earlier, uh, when I first started this, I'm, I prayed when we started, and I'm going to pray now the same prayer. And I hope for you get an understanding of the Lord's prayer that he prayed and telling us before he prayed or died that we were going to have tribulation. And then he looked up into heaven and prayed for you and I. And this is the prayer that he prayed. Father, that I was come to glorify your son, that your son should also glorify you as you have given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ of whom you have sent. As I've glorified you on the earth, I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify you and me with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name unto the men which you have given me out of the world, yours they were, and you gave them me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever you have given me are of you. For I have given unto them the words which you gave me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from you, and they have believed that you did me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which you have given me, for they are yours, and all yours are mine, and all mine are thine, and I am glorified in them, and now I am no more in the world. But these are in the world. Holy Father, keep through your own name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those that you gave me, I kept, and none of them are lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture may be fulfilled. And now come I to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. If you have sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us and that the world may believe that you have sent me and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I will that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundations of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you did send me. And I have declared unto them your name, and will declare it, that the love who I with may be in them, and I in them. Now that is the end of this presentation. I pray and hope that you will play this over and over and over again. I pray that you share it with all of your immediate family. I pray that you let your immediate family share it with other people, at least 10 people. Let everyone that hear this share this. This is, has nothing to do with me. This is all about the creator and the creator created you and he created me. He taught us and told us that we should love him with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and all our strength. And then that we should love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Those are the main two things that we have to do as a human being upon this place we call earth. In order to leave this place we call earth and go rest in eternity with the creator of all. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Because even in the prayer that we just prayed, we learned that all those who have been given to the Son are his and all his alone. And those that were not given to the Son would be with the Father in his own throne, in his own kingdom. You'll find it if you go back through the book of Revelation. I'm going to conclude it. Thank you, and have a God-blessed day. Bye-bye.